There have already been several accidents in 2024 on Mount Everest, but are any of us surprised to hear that? What you see on screen are photos and videos from the climbing season on the world's tallest mountain. I am serious, this is real footage, and I promise if you stick around later in this video, there will be a specific ominous video taken near the summit that you do not want to miss. But why? Why is it, year after year, that record number of deaths occur on the mountain? Some chalk it up to the ever-increasing number of climbers, lack of regulation, or the amateur companies leading expeditions. Today, we will dive into it all, but most importantly, tell the story of Daniel Patterson and his Nepali guide, Pastinji Sherpa. By all accounts, these two men should have reached the summit and made it off the mountain without incident. They were experienced extremely fit in climbing for all the right reasons. But this is Mount Everest. The one thing we know by now is to expect the unexpected. This is their story. The 2024 climbing season on Mount Everest is coming to a close this week, and there are several stories we will be covering on this channel, but first, would you be surprised if I told you that there were fewer permits on the peak than last year? Maybe we are learning after 2023 was the deadliest climbing season in history. In 2024, there were 421 permits issued to climbers, versus 478 permits issued in 2023. 2024 was still the second busiest year in the mountain's history so I don't think we have suddenly made a big change. The reason this is relevant is the direct correlation between the number of climbers on the peak during the season to deaths on the mountain. The more climbers, the more chances something could go wrong. But this isn't really what concerns those who take on the slopes. What is concerning is the long queues, especially higher up on the mountain. The higher you climb, the thinner the air gets, and above 8,000 meters, the oxygen level is a third of what it is at sea level, meaning even the simplest of tasks, like walking up at a slight angle, are inherently more difficult. Combine this with waiting for hours in line to the summit, well, this is why people are worried about the number of climbers, and we haven't even talked about the trash and waste that climbers are leaving behind. However, in recent years, there have been initiatives to clean up Everest, such as the mountain cleanup campaign in Nepal. They are fighting a losing battle without some regulation from the government. What these long lines to the summit do is make it easier for amateur climbers to complete their dream of summiting the tallest peak, because most of the expeditions are taking the same route through the dangerous Kumbu Icefall and nearly the same route to the summit, this has allowed expedition companies to provide fewer guides versus clientele. A few years ago, it was common to see one guide for every three to four climbers. And while this is still the stated industry standard, the truth is, we are moving away from this. The primary reason is that a guide is simply a babysitter at this point. And of course, one more reason money. Nepali relies on the money brought in through the Everest climbing season. It is the biggest supplier to their economy and how much of the country's population survives. In 2024, the country is estimated to have brought in 4.5 million in permit revenue alone. Then, all the western climbers pay for Sherpas and porters to carry their gear to base camp and eventually help them summit. Let's not kid ourselves. Nepal has an inherent interest in allowing permits to the mountain because it helps not only the local economy but also the country. So what do you get when you have greed, amateur climbers, fewer guides, and overcrowding? Well, you get more deaths and debris than we have ever seen. I wish I had a solution. And honestly, I'm not sure I'm qualified to give an opinion on how things should change. But one thing is inherently clear to me. Everest has a problem, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. In 2024, Daniel Patterson lost someone important to him. Daniel, known by his friends as Dan, was a 39-year-old from Wakefield, England. He was the co-owner of Wakefield CrossFit and had decided to climb Mount Everest to help raise money for the family of a gym member who had recently died from cancer. Dan was in great shape. By all accounts, the physical demand of climbing Everest would not be a problem for him, but he would have to get over the lack of experience. I don't mean that Dan didn't have experience climbing, he certainly did, and had summited Island Peak and arguably a more technical climb, Amadablam, in preparation for Everest. But this 
was his first time on the world's tallest peak. So he enlisted the help of 8K Expeditions, one of the most popular expedition companies in the Karakoram range. This is where Dan would meet his Sherpa, Pastinji. While Dan was known for his robust fitness, uplifting positivity, and strong determination, Pastinji Sherpa had already summited Everest twice, along with reaching the top of K2, Amadablam, and dozens of other 6,000 meter mountains. Oh, and he had done all of this before the age of 23. While young, Pastinji Sherpa was extremely experienced as he had been climbing his entire life. The 2024 season would start in late April, and on the first day, the mountain would fight the entire time. It was noted that the Kumbu Icefall, the most dangerous part of the peak, was even more difficult to navigate this year. The reason the icefall is so dangerous is because it is constantly shifting. It is typically traversed early in the morning when the ice is compact and solid, and it's not uncommon to see falling seracs or avalanches pass through the icefall. What makes this so dangerous is the amount of time you have to cross it. Typically, climbers will acclimatize on the mountain before making a summit push. This is when climbers will traverse to a certain altitude before returning to base camp, not only to familiarize themselves with the route, but their bodies as well. If a climber is adequately prepared, their chances of success greatly increase. But this means they have to pass through the Kumbu Icefall several times. For a normal climber, this usually equates to six to eight times per season. But Sherpas, well, they can traverse the icefall anywhere from 30 to 40 times. Incidents in 2023 and 2014 are why the icefall has been called a tomb for the Sherpas. But all climbers know the risks, and in 2024, the icefall was no different. It was stated as taking up to 10 hours to navigate this year, with the description of constantly changing directions, making it one of the more challenging routes in recent years. There are many reasons why this is done, but 2014 plays a big part in how the route is chosen. If you want to know more about this particular area of the mountain, I have an entire video about that event, and I'll post it down below in case you are interested. Not much is public about the exact acclimatization rotation or trip for Dan and Pastinji Sherpa, but we do know they would be traversing the South Col. This is the primary route climbers take on Everest post-2020 COVID because China still has not opened the more technical north route. A typical Everest expedition takes approximately three weeks before climbers are even thinking about taking on the upper slopes. This usually equates to seven to 11 days of traveling and hiking to Everest's base camp, then another two weeks of acclimatization trips, whether that be on Everest or nearby peaks such as Lhotse. Then, when the weather begins to clear, typically in mid-May, there is a rush to the summit. Some years, this weather window can be as short as a few days, and other years, it can be a couple of weeks. This is why there are long lines to the summit. Most expeditions will have planned to summit the peak within the same two to five day period. 8K expeditions were no different and Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would begin their bid up the mountain in mid-May. After completing the difficult Kumbu Icefall, they would have rested in Camp 1 before continuing up the mountain. While Camp 1 to Camp 4 can be dangerous, this is considered the easiest part of the trek. Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would reach Camp 4 on May 19th, and it was crowded. May 20th would be another summit day for many expeditions, and Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would be right in the middle of the long lines. Summit day starts early, typically around 1 to 3 a.m. This is so that climbers can reach the summit by late morning. One of the most important rules on the mountain is the two o'clock rule. This means that if you cannot reach the summit by 2 p.m., you should turn around because summiting after 2 p.m. means that you will be descending the peak in the dark. The descent is always more dangerous than the climb up because the adrenaline is gone, exhaustion is setting in, and your body is beginning to shut down from the lack of oxygen. That is why the air Area above 8,000 meters is the death zone. No life can sustain itself for a long period. On summit day, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa would wake up early, grab a quick breakfast, and begin the trek to the summit. Their headlamps would bounce off the snow as they walked, and there were dozens of lights in front of them. From this point to the summit, they would be fighting against other climbers. The duo would have supplemental oxygen tanks hanging from their belts, rattling as they walked. Their faces were covered with their masks, providing their only source of energy for the next 20 hours. They were mentally preparing themselves 
for one of the most difficult sections on the mountain, the Hillary Step. The Hillary Step is the last challenge for climbers on the South Call route. It is a nearly vertical rock face with a height of about 12 meters located at 8,790 meters above sea level. As climbers navigate the narrow ridge, there is a 3,000 meter drop on the right side and a 2,400 meter drop on the left. Thankfully, during peak climbing season, the Hillary Step is covered in snow, making it easier to traverse. But it is not uncommon for climbers to see bodies of other fallen climbers as they traverse this section. Nothing was exciting about Dan and Pastinji Sherpa's bid to the summit. They walked in line, taking small steps when it was their turn to move, slowly making progress. They traversed the slopes, then the Hillary Step, and the final push to the summit, before standing on top of the world. But all climbers know this is only half the battle. After reaching the summit, they would take a moment to document their achievement, then begin fighting the crowds back down to the Hillary Step. As they were fighting the ongoing traffic both ways, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa began traversing the narrow ridge. As they moved, they would constantly be detaching and reattaching their harness onto the guide rope along the ridge. This was a last ditch effort to protect climbers from falling and had been set up by the first Sherpas who trailblazed their way to the summit. At 4.40 a.m. on May 21st, 2024, they moved through the Hillary Step and everything was normal. Then, wasn't. One second, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa were making their way along the narrow ridge, and the next, the ridge was gone. It happened so fast that few climbers even comprehended what was going on. The thick snow known as a cornice had fallen under the pressure of all the footsteps, and under the snow was a sheer drop thousands of meters down the north side of Everest, the side of the mountain that was regulated by China and closed for the season, meaning there was no trail or climbers on this side of the peak. Earlier, I mentioned an ominous video from this season. Four climbers would fall in the collapse, and two of those climbers would make their way back up the Hillary Step, still attached to the guide rope. This video shows one of those climbers, but two climbers were missing, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa. Search efforts would begin, but it was slow, and honestly, it was extremely difficult because the north side of the mountain was untraversed in 2024. Another Sherpa in base camp would describe the search, it is going to be difficult to search for them because they have fallen on the Tibet side, which needs coordination. To make matters worse, the Everest season was expected to only last a few more days. It is now early June, and rescue efforts have been unable to locate Dan or Pastinji Sherpa. Dan's partner, Bex, would start a GoFundMe to raise funds to search for him, and as of the recording of this video, she has raised £126,000 out of the £150,000 goal. She states the funds would be used for helicopter flights and aerial searches, along with specialized equipment, communication, and logistical support. But the most recent update stated that because of his location, nobody was able to assist in the search or rescue for Dan. Today, Dan and Pastinji Sherpa are still listed as missing, but almost everyone knows that the duo couldn't have survived the fall. While some may blame the traffic on Everest, I honestly believe that what happened was an accident. An accident that shouldn't have happened. This isn't a case of amateur climbers or an expedition not being prepared, but simply the mountain fighting back. The reality is that Everest is going to continue to have more climbers on the mountain each year, and each year we are going to see the death toll rise. There is a direct interest for Nepal to continue issuing permits, and there are more people than ever trying to climb Everest. Potentially, China will reopen the north side of the mountain, and that may help with traffic on one side, but most amateur climbers are still going to traverse the less technical south route. So what do we do? There is overcrowding, waste issues, fewer guides to clients, and millions of dollars being thrown around. I think the better question is should we do anything? I do believe that taking care of the mountain is the most important factor here, but who am I to stop people from attempting a lifelong goal, just as long as they know the risks? I hope you all enjoyed. Until next time.